<laughs> Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. So happy to see everybody out here this morning. It's a beautiful day as we come together and celebrate Jesus and look forward to him speaking to us. Um, where we are, where we are, hoping to have our hearts um, spoken to today. I'd like to welcome anybody here who is visiting with us today. We have a nice crowd out, and if you're here for the first time, we're so glad you're here. We want to get to know you. For anybody who's here, we have these connect cards in the pews and the pockets in, in front of you. If you would take that card and fill it out and let us know uh, your information, um, how, how we can get back in contact with you, how we can be praying for you. These cards can also be used for prayer requests, requests for our church body, uh, where the men get together on Tuesday mornings and uh, pray for those. And uh, so we, we'd love to get to know you. Um, if you are watching us remotely um, on our Facebook Live stream or on YouTube later on, uh, we'd love to get to uh, know you as well. You can go to our website, hbcfitchburg.com, and there's a contact us button that you can click there and give us your information and we'd love to get back to you. Um, some announcements. So, Tuesday, like I said, Tuesday morning, 7 a.m., men's prayer. And Wednesday, we have two online prayer meetings via Zoom. One's hosted by Earl Kinney and the other by Norm Nutter. And the information for contacting them is in our bulletin. Um, if you need, if you want to be involved remotely, you can go on hbcfishboard.com, contact us and ask, and we'll send you the information there. We have a food pantry coming up this weekend, and uh, we had a, a good number of men come out yesterday uh, to help. Um, we're finally getting some uh, new commercial refrigeration units put in, the refrigeration and freezers, and we had to, to move this, the stuff out, and we had a good group come out yesterday to, to help with that, and we're so grateful for those who, who came to do that. Um, and I'd like to also just mention that this uh, yesterday was Armed Forces Day, and uh, it's not uh, one of the uh, holidays that gets as mentioned as much as some of the others, but it's a day where we recognize and, and show appreciation for those who are active in service in our, in our military, our armed forces all around the world. And we'd just like to, to, to say thank you to, to those who serve and Godspeed. And um, I think, John, do you have one? Uh, an announcement as yeah. well. And before the call to worship, I just also uh, had a couple things that I wanted to announce. Um, so, as you guys know, it sent out an email, um, I think a little over a week ago. For Mother's Day, uh, Brianna had wanted to help some of the mothers in the area. So, she had just posted, you know, on Facebook, hey, if anyone needs help with diapers, formula, and stuff for babies, let us know. We'd like to help. And we just got overwhelmed with, with people asking for help, which is great. Um, so, so far we've been able to help eight families, um, provide them with diapers, some formula, and some other needs. We still have um, some families left to deliver um, diapers and such too. And then also, so in doing this, we realized, you know what, we really need to get more like baby formula and stuff. That seems to be something that people in our context really are in need of help help with. And so, of course, God answered, um, before we could honestly even pray about it, he said, hey, you need formula, let me get you some. <laughs> so our food bank uh, down in Worcester County actually provided us for free about $7,000 worth of baby formula. Over 300 cans, uh, they've got those little bottles that you typically get at the hospital, you know, for the newborns. So we've got the stuff there to help people with. We, we know the need. We have a way to reach out to find the people who need the help. Basically, at this point, before we can bring this to the community, we really need people who are willing to deliver some of this formula. A lot of these families don't have cars. Um, they walk everywhere, so we need people to, to help us, to volunteer, to say, hey, whatever family it is, let me know. Give me the name, address, phone number. I'll bring it out to them. I'll coordinate with them. But this is a great opportunity for us to really reach our context, to really show the love of Christ, and these families appreciate it. 
Um, just personally, we've already, Brianna and I have formed three really solid relationships with people right here in our very community. They, some of them live 10 minutes within where we're worshiping right now. So if you want to be a part of that, I would encourage you to come help us with that. Um, the Lord's really going to use us in a great way, but we can't put it out there unless we have the hands and feet, the help ready to go. Otherwise, it, it'll just bomb on us. So please pray about um, getting involved and, and helping us with that. Um, also, too, as you're out and about, maybe with your impact, one person or out in your community talking with people, we have a benevolence fund set up in our budget this year. So if you're, if you're forming a relationship with somebody, you impact one person or whatever, and we have a need that we can help with, let us know, because that's what we have this fun set up for. We are trying to love and help and serve our, our communities, those who, who are in need of our help. So we'll be praying about that and let us know what we can do to assist you as you're ministering to people in your circle of influence. Um, so that was that announcement. Why don't we stand for the call to worship? Our worship this morning is in Psalm 32, Psalm chapter 32, starting in verse 1, it says, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. I acknowledged my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Therefore, let everyone who is godly offer prayer to you at a time when you may be found. Surely in the rush of great waters they shall not reach they shall not reach him. You are a hiding place for me, you preserve me from trouble, you surround me with shouts of deliverance. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my eye upon you. Be not like a horse or a mule without understanding, which must be curbed with bit and bridle, or it will not stay near you. Many are the sorrows of the wicked, but steadfast love surrounds the one who trusts in the Lord. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, O righteous, and shout for joy, all you upright in heart. What a great reminder for us this morning that when we struggle with sin and we bring it to the Lord and confess what is going on, He is faithful and just to forgive us. And here, David is saying when he kept silent about his sin, when he kept it from the Lord, it had a physical effect on his body. He says he, his bones wasted away, he was groaning all day long, and he felt the heavy hand on the, of the Lord upon him. And he said, when I acknowledged my sin, everything changed because the Lord overwhelmed me with his grace and his forgiveness. And the same is for us this morning. We have a God who wants to overwhelm us with forgiveness and grace, we need to come to him with an open heart, let him know what is going on. And then I love at the end of the psalm, David is, is prophetically speaking for the Lord here, right? Starting in verse 8, when God is literally saying through David, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. We have a God who is willing and wanting to instruct us in the way we should go. Amen? Amen. Right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. And Lord, we understand we only have that privilege because our sins are forgiven through the blood that was shed on the cross by Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. We thank you, Lord, that when we come and we confess our wrongdoings to you, that you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And thank you, Lord, that you are so desiring and willing to instruct us and to lead us and guide us in the way that we should go. So, Lord, we come to worship you this morning. We've come to hear your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit would change us, transform us, help us to leave more in the image of Jesus Christ, to leave changed, to live differently, Lord, to live for you. 
We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take our hymnals and turn to number 508. 508. We're going to sing a hymn that talks about how we were delivered from sin. And we cried out. Love lifted me. <laughs> chapter 20, verses 18 through 24. In this passage, it comes uh, near the end of Paul's third and final missionary journey. And Paul calls for the elders of the church in Ephesus to meet him in the nearby city of Miletus so that he can encourage them and say goodbye. So starting in verse 18. When they arrived, he said to them, you know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance 
and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing that will, what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise your holy name for the mercy and grace that you have shown us through your Son, Jesus. Father, we were lost in our sins and had no hope bound for, for an eternal separation from you in hell. Out of love, you made a way for us to have our sins wiped away, but at the immeasurable cost of sending your Son to earth as a man to die in our place as the perfect, spotless sacrifice on the cross. Hallelujah. We can have forgiveness of sins if we believe in Jesus and put our trust in him for salvation. And that is the reason why we gather here, to worship you, our Savior and our Redeemer. You alone are worthy of our praise. Lord, your word teaches us that your plan for believers is for us to join together in local communities to be your ambassadors to bring good news of salvation through Jesus to our neighbors who are lost in sin. Father, we ask for forgiveness for how we have ignored them, avoided them, judged them, and disparaged them. How easily we forget that without your mercy and grace, we would be right there with them. So Lord, give us your heart for unbelievers, a heart that mimics the humility of Jesus. Inspire us to pray for them, that they would be dissatisfied with the status quo of their lives, that they would be convicted of sin, that you would give us opportunities to love them and to share the good news of Jesus with them. And Lord, we ask for your spirit to give us courage and boldness, that we would not live scared, but rather in the power of the gospel. Lord, thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul, who considered his life nothing except for the purpose of spreading the gospel. It seemed there was no level of hardship or persecution that would stop him. And Father, if we are honest, we know that we are far from that dedication. Lord, we confess that we fail to surrender all to you. Work in our lives to increase our faith that would give us victory over our fears and put others before ourselves. Lord, we turn to the needs of our church family. We lift up to you our dear sister Mary Jane and her family and the loss of her husband Donald this week. Comfort the brokenhearted as only you can. We pray for Franny Vital as he recovers from vascular surgery and ask that it brings relief to the neuropathy that plagues him. We pray for healing and strength for those who are dealing with cancer treatments and therapies. Don Wall, Dennis Teresi, Earl Kenny, and Florence Futurler's daughter, Debbie. We pray for those recovering from injuries, for Jen Murray and Tammy Fletcher. Lord, we thank you that Jen is here with us today. We're so glad that she is here, able to come. Lord, there are many who struggle with chronic pain and conditions. Faith Arnold, Opal Leeds, Jen and Alan Murray. I'm sure many others, you know who they are. We pray for relief for them and for strength and perseverance. Lord, we pray for those who are confined and unable to join us. Kay Camacho, Mark Kelly, Joyce Chitanis, Linda Fletcher. Father, we ask that they would feel your presence with them and when they are feeling lonely and help them to know how precious they are to you. Lord, for all these folks, we pray that you would help us as a church to minister to them as we are a family. Father, uh, as Armed Forces Day was yesterday, we pray for those who are serving in our the military, Lord. We ask for your protection for them, Lord. We pray especially for those who are believers and 
what continued to be a more and more difficult place for uh, believers to uh, to serve. Um, Lord, we just ask that uh, you would be at work in our military, that you would strengthen those who are believers and help them to uh, to be able to, to share the gospel and, and Lord, to, to, to love those that, that are there serving beside them. And Father, may your spirit be upon Johnny as he brings us the message that you have led him to share. Teach us, convict us, encourage us through the power of your holy word. And we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we get into what we're discussing this morning, let's do a quick recap um, for those of you who weren't able to make it or watch online. But last week we focused in on our call to encourage and to edify one another. Right? If you remember, we had that sledgehammer up here, and right, we talked we talked about that illustration on how, right, when the temple was dedicated. And the Lord's presence was clearly in that place. Nobody would have dared do anything to that temple because of the awe and reverence for God and His Spirit dwelling there. And how now that format doesn't exist, right? That we are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. Those of us who have repented and confessed our sin and placed our faith in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the Lord now lives in us. It no, long, no longer dwells in a physical place, building as the temple. And so, but we talked about how when we do not use our words to encourage and edify each other and we use those things to tear each other down or to gossip, it's like taking, it would be like taking a sledgehammer to the Old Testament temple, right? We may not realize it, but that's the severity of what we do. And so the New Testament calls us to use our words to build up, to encourage each other, to draw each other closer to the Lord, right? So in our context, we're seeking to point one another towards God, right? And we saw this command throughout the New Testament in many of the epistles to the local churches. It was a big part of the church's corporate gathering, right? When they met together, you would, we would see them encouraging each other and edifying each other, right? They needed it, especially in that time when they were facing persecution, um, from all around. All right, we talked about uh, encouragement and edification being important because, number one, it's, it's a witness of our supernatural origin to the world, right? Outside of the church, people are always tearing each other down with their words and discouraging each other. But in the church, since we are of a supernatural origin, it's to be different here, right? So it lets the world know that we are different for a reason. Right? It's because of God. And also in the church, the New Testament tells us that we inevitably will face trouble in this world. Right, The Christian life is not a cakewalk. So therefore, we desperately need a culture that is encouraging, that is edifying, to keep each other going, living uh, for God. And then lastly, we talked about how we can grow to be better um, at encouraging and edifying one another, right? By praying for God to make us better encouragers, by praying for guidance to whom needs encouragement because we don't always know what's going on in someone's life, but the Lord knows and He can lead us to who needs encouragement. We must pray for God to give us a culture of encouragement, right? We talked about if we don't ask God to do something, then why should we expect Him to do it, right? So if we want a culture of encouragement within our church, we need to continually ask God to do that. And then lastly, we talked about how uh, those of us who are not naturally encouragers, who don't have that spiritual gift, we need to make encouragement a daily discipline, right? We need to set reminders for ourselves. 
whether it's to just text somebody, call somebody, email, send a card, something that just sends a little bit encouragement to somebody each day. And the Lord will use that in a great way. And it will help us build this culture of encouraging each other and edifying each other. And so today, this message is actually a perfect follow-up um, to what we went over last week. All right, so today we are going to be talking about the call for us to pray and to confess, right? And that's specifically um, to one another. So to pray and to confess to one another. So let's just go over the main points of what we're going to be discussing this morning. So first, we're going to talk about what does it mean to confess to one another? Right? What does this actually mean? I think we're all pretty sure on what prayer is, right? Uh, I don't think we need to talk too much about that. But um, confession, we want to make sure that we're on the same page about what that means, what it looks like. Um, Secondly, we're going to talk about when should we confess to one another, right? What do the scriptures say? What are the different scenarios in which we should confess to one another? And then lastly, what do we gain from confessing to one another, right? What do we gain? What are the pros to doing this, right? So we're not going to be in any particular um, one passage of scripture. We're going to be jumping around a lot. So let me just throw out some passages that we will be in if you want to kind of get your, your uh, Bible ready. Um, we're going to be in the book of Matthew. Book of Matthew, book of Galatians. Uh, book of Ephesians, which is right next to it. Book of James. And then 1 John. All right, so I'll repeat that list. We're going to be in Matthew... Galatians, Ephesians, James, and 1 John. All right? It's going to be all over the New Testament this morning. Um, so before we jump into to point number one, let me just pray um, over the message this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing, allowing us to be here. Please be with us as we talk about praying and confessing um, towards one another. I pray your spirit would teach us this morning, make us more like Jesus, um, give us understanding of what you're trying to um, tell us this morning, and help us to, Lord, not just be hearers, but to be doers, to really seek to apply this to our lives um, so we can be this gospel-revealing community that you have called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, what exactly does it mean to confess to one another? This is important for us to be on the same page and to understand what we're talking about. So, the word confess simply means to agree, to admit, or to say the same thing. Right? Let me say that again. So, the word confess means to agree, to admit, or to say the same thing. So in our context, as believers, it involves identifying sin for what it truly is. Right? We identify sin for what it truly is, and we honestly acknowledge the offenses we have committed, and it should also include an attitude of turning away from sin. Right? So that's confession in our context. We acknowledge, we, I, we first identify sin for what it truly is. It's sin is offensive to God. It's something that He does not like or take pleasure in. It's something that needs to be forgiven and dealt with, right? We honestly acknowledge the offenses, right? So we don't back down to what we've done. We openly acknowledge what we have done that is offensive to the Lord. And then we also have an attitude of turning away from it, what we typically call repentance, right? So confession and repentance should really go hand in hand together. We confess what we've done to the Lord, and we say, God, I am choosing not to go back that way, right? I'm choosing to, to live in the path that you would want me to. 
So that's what it means to confess. So those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ, who have placed our faith in Him, right, who have asked Him to forgive us for our sins, confession is a daily part of our walk, right? Because we're not perfect. Even when we placed our, our faith in Jesus Christ, we continually still struggle with sin, right? And so we have to make sure we are continually confessing our sin to the Lord and and understanding that it was Christ's death on the cross that pays the penalty for our sin, right? So 1 John, uh, 1, 1 John 1, 9 through 10, right? If you're, if you're already there, if you want to flip there, if not, I'm going to read it for you. It tells us, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then look what else he adds here, he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him, speaking of God, a liar, and his word is not in us. So basically, John is saying, look, even as Christians, right, we're still sinners. So if there's anyone who says they don't struggle with sin and who's not confessing to the Lord, you're calling God a liar because we all struggle. We all need to continually to confess our sins to him. Even though we are forgiven, right, we confess our sins because when we sin, it breaks our fellowship with the Lord, right? You ever been, find yourself in a scenario where you've kind of let sin go a little bit too far, unconfessed, and you can feel yourself drifting further from the Lord? You just feel like His presence is not the same like it used to be? And then when we confess that sin, right, it's like that fellowship is restored, um, with God. So that's why we continually confess our sin, right? Our sin has, has been forgiven by Jesus dying on the cross, right? He was faithful and just to cleanse us from our unrighteousness, but we constantly need to confess so we can make sure our fellowship with the Lord is tight, right? And that we're not far from Him. So when we confess, we basically verbalize our sin to the Lord, and we understand how God feels about it. We understand that He is not pleased with it, but we also understand that He is faithful and just to cleanse, and that He will forgive, and He will overwhelm us with His grace and mercy. Right? So therefore, we don't have to continue to feel shame and guilt about that sin. Right? That doesn't come from God. So as followers of Christ, again, we regularly confess our sins and shortcomings to the Lord. When we sin, we need to own up to it and bring it to Him. And again, regular confession to the Lord is important because it keeps our fellowship close with Him, it keeps us on track, and it also keeps us humble. Right? When we regularly confess our sins to the Lord, it reminds us that we're not perfect. We don't have it all together. It keeps us humble, which will then have an effect on how we look at others and how we treat others. When we know we're not perfect, we're not going to expect that of other people. All right, so that is what it means um, to confess. So, let's go to the second question. When should we confess to one another? All right, so while regular confession to the Lord is imperative, right, the Scriptures also call us to confess to one another. Those of us who are committed to each other as the local church here, we are called to also confess to one another. So before we get into that, let me just do some quick clarifying, answer some questions that might be running, running through your mind at this point. So Jesus Christ, as a reminder, is our high priest, and he is our mediator between us and God. So therefore, we can go directly to Jesus for forgiveness of our sins because Jesus is the only one who can forgive our sin, right? 1 Timothy 2.5 tells us, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. And then Hebrews 4.14-16 4, through 16 tells us, Since we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a great high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is, 
in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. And here's the beautiful part. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have direct access to God. So this is why we, you don't see confession booths here, right, in the back. We don't have confession booths. We don't practice regular confession to the pastor, nor do I want you to, okay? I don't want to know everything that you're doing every day, believe me. <laughs> and nor do you want to know everything that I do, okay? Let's just get that out of the way. That's why we don't, we don't practice regular confession to the pastor. Every believer has direct access to God through prayer. We can all go to his throne at any time. Our forgive, the forgiveness for our sins is not dependent on any person except for Jesus Christ alone. Amen? Amen. However, even though all of that is true, God does still want us to confess our sins to one another for other purposes than to have our sin forgiven, okay? So we don't confess our sins to one another seeking to have our sins forgiven. That only comes from God himself. But there are other reasons why the scriptures, why God wants us to be open and honest with each other for the sins that we commit and our struggles and shortcomings. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at four scenarios that we find in the New Testament in which God would have us confess our sins to one another. There's four distinct scenarios in which he calls us to do this. All right. So let's look at the first one. So the first scenario in which we are to confess to one another is if we sin against someone. I don't know why I included a question mark in there. Sorry about that. But anyway, if we sin against somebody, if, you have, if you're in Matthew, go to Matthew chapter 5, verse 24. Let's see what Jesus is telling us here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 24. Here, Jesus tells us, right, and this is said in the context of bringing an offering. At this time, they were still, the temple was still up, so they were still bringing offerings and sacrifices to the temple for God. And here's what Jesus says. He says, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. All right, so what Jesus is saying is if you come to bring an offering to the Lord, but you have something, an issue with your brother that has not been solved, leave your offering and go reconcile to him first and then come back and give your offering. So when we do or say something to our brother or our sister in Christ that we know is wrong, or sinful, God tells us that we need to seek reconciliation, which involves confession, confessing and owning up to what we did or said, and seeking forgiveness from that person. All right, so it's impossible for us to reconcile without confession, without owning up to what we did. All right, so for example, let's just say I'm having a really bad day, and, um, and I decide I'm going to let Don Wall have it. <laughs> I know he would like to be a part of this. <laughs> Let's just say, I don't know, I just say something really nasty to Don that I shouldn't have said, right? And, uh, and then later on, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, man, you know what? I really, I shouldn't have said that to Don. Should I just sweep it under the rug and say, ah, he'll get over it? No. I need to go to Don and say, Don, you know what? This is what I said. I was having a bad day. It's not an excuse. I shouldn't have done what I did. Forgive me. Right? So what did I do? I went to him and I confessed my sin to him, what I did against him. And I sought to be reconciled to him. Right? So that's what Jesus is telling us. If you've done something to someone, don't sweep it under the rug. Don't ignore it. Even if it's something that you might think is little, maybe to that other person it wasn't little. Maybe to them it really hurt them. Maybe they were having a bad day too, and that little thing that we, or what we thought was little, is just really had an impact on them. 
So go and confess your sin to that person and be reconciled to them. Right? So that's one scenario in which we are to confess to one another when we sin against someone. Secondly, if someone sins against us. Right? So this kind of ties in to the, to the first one here. But you're already in Matthew, so turn over a few pages to Matthew 18. Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. And we've gone over this text um, a few times, but it's an important text or important passage. So here, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. So let's go back to the, the, the situation where I let Don have it, all right? So let's just say I do that, and I never go to Don, right? And I never, I, I'm never, uh, I don't reconcile to him, right? I don't confess what I did to him. I don't come to him and say, Don, I'm sorry for what I did. Well, then, Don, if I don't do that, then he now has a responsibility to come to me, right? So this is the other way around. If I don't come to him, and he's really just stirring about it, and, man, you know what? I can't believe Johnny hasn't come and made this right with me. What's going on? Right? Is Don supposed to sweep that under the rug and just forget about it? No. No, you, can, you guys can answer. It's all right. No, right? Right? According to, to Jesus here, he says if... Your brother sins against you. Go to him and tell him his fault. So at this point, what Don should do is he should seek a confession from me. Right? It says, go tell him his fault. And remember, confession is just simply agreeing to admit, to say the same thing. So what Don would do is he's trying to get me to realize what I did, to say the same thing, to confess what I did to him, to own up to it. And it's my job then to own up to it and say, wow, you know what? I'm so sorry. I totally forgot I even did that. Or, you know what? I didn't realize you felt that way. Or whatever the case may be. Then I apologize. I seek his forgiveness. We reconcile. And it's squashed. Right? So that's another scenario in which we confess to one another. Except in this case we are seeking to get the confession from somebody else, right? Don's not coming to me confessing. He's trying to come to me to give me the opportunity to confess. Make sense? Yes. Cool. <laughs> if, you need, if we need to slow down, I can re- go over it. I want to make sure we understand. So, but that's scenario number two. Scenario number three. Now we're getting a little bit more uncomfortable. Okay, scenario three is if someone is living in sin. What's even more awkward is the fact that these all have question marks. I'm sorry about that. I must have just not realized they were there. Anyway, if someone is living in sin, turn over to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Here, listen to what Paul is telling the, the Galatians here. Starting in verse 1 of chapter 6, he says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So in this scenario... There is somebody in the church who is living a lifestyle that is not pleasing to God, right? Key word there is a lifestyle. It's something that they've not done just once, but they are continually, habitually making sin a lifestyle. And it's now having effect on the reputation of God and the reputation of the church, and it has to be addressed. It has to be dealt with. It's it's now gone out of control. This person is in need of spiritual restoration. So they may not be doing anything directly to anyone else in the church that would require scenario one or two, right? 
But again, they are living a lifestyle of sin that is having a negative impact on the reputation of the church. It's tarnishing the image of God, and we cannot let it continue. Right? The person needs to be steered back on the right direction. So those who are taxed, tasked with the restoring of this individual, right? In Galatians, it says those who are spiritual restore him. Right? So that doesn't necessarily have to be the elders or the deacons. It can be people who are mature in the faith within the church who are going to help this person be restored. Right? Those who are spiritual. So those who are a part of the restoration of this person, they have to seek a confession from this person. The person who is living in this lifestyle has to confess, right? Because how can somebody be restored if they don't own up to what they're doing, right? If they're, if they're just, whatever they're doing, they're not gonna, they don't believe it's sin or they don't believe it's wrong or they don't want to stop, right? Because remember, confession, a part of confession should have that attitude of repentance of wanting to turn from that sin and not continue in it anymore, Right? So again, those who are spiritual in, dis- in discussions with this person say, hey, you, you need to confess what you're doing. Right? What you're doing is not right. You need to own up to that and realize that God is not happy with the lifestyle you are living and you need to turn from it. And we are here to help you and we are here to be gentle and meek and to offer you grace and mercy, but we are calling you to stop. Right? We are trying to restore you. But again, what has to happen? Confession to one another. All right, so basically this scenario is very similar to scenario number two, except in scenario number three, this person is not necessarily sinned against somebody within the congregation, but they are acting in a a sinful lifestyle. Um, I've personally had to be a part of this uh, many years ago. Um... It's, it's hard to sometimes even talk about, but I had a pastor who I loved dearly. And um, unfortunately, he was being unfaithful to his spouse. And he, um, so he didn't sin against necessarily anybody in the church, right? He didn't do anything against me or anybody. He didn't have to, you know, seek our forgiveness except for his spouse, technically. Um, but at that time, the deacons in our church, right, they were deemed with the task of spiritually restoring him. So they had to confront him and say, hey, we understand that this is going on, right? And they needed to seek a confession um, from him. And that can be a very hard thing to do. It can be awkward. It can create a lot of tension, right? Nobody wants to do that, but it's necessary. It's necessary for the purity of the church. Um, It's necessary for the restoration of that person. Um, But it's not easy by any stretch of the means, I'll be honest with you. Especially when that person is not willing to actually confess and to own up to what they're doing or to own up to the fact that it's wrong and they need to stop. Right Now that's a whole other conversation for a (laughs) a different Sunday morning. But if someone is living in sin... We are tasked to help bring restoration to them, and part of that restoration is confession, one person to another. And then here's the last one, right? The fourth scenario. General confession of sin and struggles. Again, that question mark, it's really bugging me. (laughs) I'm like sitting here trying to figure out why I left that in there. Anyway, it's the OCD in me. So the New Testament calls us to confess our sin and our struggles to one another. Now, this scenario is probably the one that believers are uh, most leery of, maybe even a little bit resilient about, uh, especially amongst conservative churches. Um, So for that reason, we're going to spend more time on this scenario than the other three. Um, and because it's imperative that we really get this. I think one of the reasons believers are leery of confessing their sin and struggles to someone else 
other than God is because of abuse that we've seen, unfortunately, from priests who have used their, I put quote-unquote, authority, right? They don't actually have the authority to forgive sins, but they're kind of put on that level. Um, we've seen that authority abused, and they use it to manipulate and to control people, which is not right, but it, it's happened and it continues to happen. Right? So we struggle with that because we don't want that to happen here, right? Of course not. Right? Again, so many people who are of the Catholic belief system, they believe that they need to continue to um, consistently confess their sins to a priest in order for God to forgive them, which we have seen is not biblically accurate. Right? We confess our sins to Jesus because he's the only one who can forgive us. There's no mediator. Jesus is our mediator. And he's God himself. Right? So our mediator is actually the person who forgives us our sins. So good for us. We don't need anybody to um, have forgiveness of our sins. So therefore, we sort of throw out the baby with the bathwater. Right? And then so we say, well, we don't want that. So we're just not going to confess our sins to one another so we don't get caught up in all of that abuse and manipulation and control that happens and we're just going to keep our sin to ourselves and to God. Another reason I think it's a struggle for us is because if we're honest, we feel if we confess our sin or our struggles to someone that we will be judged and potentially treated differently. Right? If we're honest, I've dealt with that. It's tough for somebody to know what you're struggling with, your shortcomings. Right? Naturally, we have this natural inclination of self-preservation. We don't want people's image of us to be tarnished, right? We don't want people to think of us as, oh, as something different. Right? So what we do is... (laughs) So what we do is, and in order for us to preserve our image, our self-preservation, we don't let people in to what's really going on. Turn over to James, book of James, chapter 5, verse 16. Book of James is a very challenging book, a very practical, but very challenging It's a book um, that really we should all probably go through like once a year personally, you know, just as a reminder. James really challenges us in his, in what he says. So James chapter 5 verse 16, he says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. I'm going to read that again. It says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So, right, so in this context, James is, is telling the church, he says, Hey, is anyone amongst you sick? Right, starting in verse 14. Let him call for the elders of the church so they can anoint with oil and pray over the person, right, so they can be healed. Now, there's some discrepancy, or not discrepancy, but some people believe that, hey, what does it mean if that person is sick? Is it like a physical sickness, like they have the flu or something like that, or is it more of a a, a spiritual kind of sickness to it, right? The context doesn't make it too clear to us, but nevertheless, that person is is sick. And then, thrown into that context, it says, confess your sins to one another. Right? This calls us back to what we read this morning in Psalm 32. Remember when David, he said, when I kept silent, right? He's saying, when I kept silent about my sin, my bones wasted away. I was groaning all day long. Your hand, speaking of the Lord's hand, was heavy 
upon me. It's clearly not heavy upon him. <laughs> right? And David says, my strength was dried up. Right? So David, when he kept quiet about his sin, when he kept it unconfessed, he was experiencing physical ailments until he confessed it to the Lord in his context. But in this context, James is telling the church, you should also confess it to one another, interestingly enough. Let's pair this now with Ephesians. If you're in the book of Ephesians, chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. So here is what Paul tells the Ephesian church and his telling us. He says, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Right before we knew Jesus Christ before when we were still in our sin and we had not experienced God's grace and forgiveness of our sin, we were in darkness. But those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ, who have confessed our sin to the Lord and repented of it and trusted in Jesus to forgive us, we are now children of light. So Paul says, walk as children of light. You're no longer children of darkness. I love what Pastor um, John Piper, a lot of you are probably familiar with him, um, author, great pastor, great teacher of the word. Listen to what he says about being children of light and what that means and looks like. He says, since we're children of light and part of light is truth, Christian community won't be marked by secretiveness. We won't try to look on the outside what we aren't in the inside. You need to be known as an open book, appropriately read by accountable, mature people in your life. Let me just read that statement one more time. It says, since we're children of light and part of light is truth, Christian community won't be marked by secretiveness. We won't try to look on the outside what we aren't in the inside. You need to be known as an open book, appropriately read by accountable, mature people in your life. So, what I'm not saying is you should not tell everyone in the church your sin and your struggles, right? That wouldn't be a good idea. We need to use wisdom in who we choose to be open and vulnerable with, right? Those people should be mature in the faith, right? In the book of Galatians says those who are spiritual, right? Those who are able to help us in our restoration to get over whatever it is we need to get over. But the main idea that we're talking about this morning is we all, including myself, especially myself, we need spiritual people in our lives whom we can trust to show us mercy and grace and help restore us, as what we saw in Galatians 6.1. We need people whom we can trust, that when we confess our sin and our struggles to them, they're not going to judge us. They're not going to treat us differently. They're going to respond with gentleness, meekness, with love, grace and mercy, and they are going to be a part of helping restore us. They're going to pray for us, right? As in the book of James, right? The prayer of a righteous person. They are going to be praying for us. They are going to be going to the throne of God alongside of us. In my early years of walking with the Lord, I got, remember, I got saved when I was 14 years old. So I did have some struggles that followed me after I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, right? Because I didn't become perfect. I still had some of those same struggles. So in my early years of walking with the Lord, there were things that I just could not seem to get under control. I'm sure some of you guys can sympathize with me on that. Sometimes it seems as though there's certain things in our lives that we just can't seem to get under control. 
no matter how much I had prayed and confessed to God, it just didn't seem to make a difference, to be honest. Right? And it's not like I, I was going to church. I was in fellowship with other people. I was serving the Lord at a young age. I was trying to live for the Lord. I was confessing it. It's not like I was holding it in. I was repenting of it. I had a desire to turn away, but it just seemed as though I didn't have the, the willpower to, to do it, right? Again, I'm sure a lot of you guys can sympathize with me on that. We all have our different struggles and, and, and tendencies and habits. We all have different pasts, different things that we deal with and struggle with. So again, no matter how much I prayed and confessed to God, I could not seem to get it under control. And the only thing that helped me experience breakthrough was when I finally let other men into my life. Other spiritual men, I should add. Mature men in the faith. I let them into my life and told them what was going on. And I believe that part of the reason I was finally able to experience breakthrough is because of what James tells us in chapter 5, verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. I had more righteous men praying for me. I had righteous men now giving me wisdom, right? Because what I found out was a lot of them had the same struggles. So they were able to impart wisdom on me. They were able to hold me accountable, right? Not make me feel shameful or guilty, but hold me in good biblical accountability, which empowered me. That's what accountability does. It doesn't make us feel shame and guilt. It empowers us. I had other men encouraging me because they knew what was going on. And most importantly, they were overwhelming me with grace and mercy. I didn't expect that. Right? I thought if I came out with this that I would be judged, treated differently, looked at differently, not allowed to serve anymore or whatever I had made up in my mind. But instead, I was treated with grace and mercy. I was able to experience the grace and mercy of God through other people, which was powerful. And it put me on a path of breakthrough and a victory but it wouldn't have come if I didn't confess my sin and my struggles to other people. So when we confess to one another, we understand that forgiveness of our sin comes from God and God alone. But we know that we need faithful and trusted people who will join us in our battle and who will help us stay on track. They will help keep us accountable not make us feel shame and guilt, but they will keep us accountable, which will actually be empowering. It'll be empowering. That's what biblical accountability does. It gives us that push, that strength that we need to be victorious in our sin and struggles in our lives. So, that's general confession of sin and struggles. Right? Even though our forgiveness comes from the Lord, He still wants us to be honest with one another. He, right? As children of light, we're not supposed to pretend like we've got everything all together. I know we don't. I certainly don't. <laughs> right? So let's just be honest about that. And let's overwhelm each other with mercy and grace. Right? This, this is perfect after just talking about encouraging and edifying one another. We now, when we're honest with each other and we know what each other is struggling with, we have a better way to encourage one another, a better way to edify each other because we know what's going on. So what do we gain then from confessing one to another? All right, not that we should, um, whatever, you know, at the end of the day, we do what we do because the Lord calls us to do something. So, right, we want to be obedient. But everything that the Lord calls us to do, 
does have a benefit. It has a benefit that I do want us to look at. Right? God always has our, our best interest in mind. So what do we gain from confessing to one another? Well, first we gain prayer. Right? Like I just alluded to in my personal experience, we, when we allow ourselves to be vulnerable and let others in, we gain prayer from other righteous people, which makes a difference. For whatever reason, I can't exactly explain it, but when you have other righteous people beside yourself praying for something, it's, it's, things, it makes a difference. I don't know exactly how to explain it. It just does. I've experienced it. I'm sure you have experienced it. That's why, right, that we have prayer Sunday mornings, especially the elder prayer, and we pray over different things that are going on in people's lives because we understand the more righteous people bring in the same thing to the throne of God, the better. Amen. Right? And we pray because we want to see victory in that scenario. We want to see healing take place. Right? So we want to have more people praying for us. We also gain encouragement and edification. Right? This is when it comes to praying for each other. If someone comes to you and is confessing to you, you have a perfect opportunity to pray for them, to encourage them, to edify them. And sometimes that's just the thing we need to have victory in whatever it is that we are struggling with. So again, when someone knows our struggles and shortcomings, they are better equipped to encourage and to edify because they know what is going on. We also gain a culture of intimacy and tight relationships. Right? When we are open and honest with one another, we draw closer to each other, which is also a powerful testimony to the world. Right? All the things that we're talking about this morning, they typically don't happen in the secular world, especially not in our job places, right? I used to work in a car dealership. If someone did something to you, well, you better just get over it, right? Because they're not coming to apologize. <laughs> just continue on with your day. If you do something to someone else, whatever, they'll get over it. We don't have time to waste time in confessing to each other and apologizing, right? But in the church, we are supernatural. We are called to be different than the world. So when people come and they see a church who is willing to ask for forgiveness, to be open and honest with each other, that is a powerful testimony of the fact that we have a supernatural origin, that God himself has put this thing together. So we gain a culture of intimacy and tight relationships. I think someone's calling to confess. Tell them I'll call them back. <laughs> As you can tell, I like to joke around sometimes. Ministry should be exciting, right? It should never be boring. We should have fun along the way. We also gain victory over sin that we can't seem to conquer on our own. Right? I alluded to that in my personal, uh, my personal example. Right? We gain victory over sin that we can't seem to conquer on our own. Get this. I really need you to get this. Satan will tempt us into isolation. And he will try to convince us that being honest with others will do more harm than good. He will try to get into your head to get you to stay secretive about that thing, whatever that sin is or that struggle is try to convince you to just deal with it on your own. There's no need to talk about it with anyone else. It will do more harm than good if you let that thing out. People will look at you differently. They'll treat you differently. Just be quiet about it. Don't let it out. That's not of God. That's of the devil. He will try to keep us to ourselves. At least, so like with me, sometimes victory in whatever that thing is, it's just a conversation away. It's just a conversation away with another brother and sister in Christ who care about you, who love you, and who will overwhelm you with God's grace and mercy, who will come alongside of you and pray and encourage and edify and restore you. 
but it takes us just having that conversation and being honest and vulnerable. Vulnerability can be scary. I'm not saying it's easy, but we need to be. We need to be willing to be vulnerable with one another. And when somebody is vulnerable with us, right, when someone comes to us because they think, you know, they see us as someone spiritual who can help them, we cannot take advantage of that. We've got to overwhelm them with grace and mercy, not be judgmental, be quick to encourage and to edify and to pray and to make them feel supported. I think a lot of us have probably, I myself, right, we probably can look back in situations where we've been vulnerable with people and we've been burned. And therefore, we're scared to kind of do it again because someone has not done what they were supposed to do or responded in a godly way. And Satan will use that to constantly remind us, but we need to to be open and honest with each other. And when someone is open and honest with us, just be like Jesus to them, right? Love them, care for them, pray for them, support them, be a part of helping restore them in a spirit of gentleness, right? As Galatians said. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, I know what we talked about today isn't the easiest thing, but Lord, it is so important for us to have a culture in where we are comfortable being open and honest with each other in confessing our sins to one another so we can seek restoration, so we can seek victory in prayer. Father, I know Satan is going to work tirelessly to keep us from doing this. We ask for your power and your strength. We ask for the courage, Lord, to be vulnerable with one another. I know it's difficult, but Lord, it's important. There may be some, Lord, here this morning that maybe they've never done this, but maybe you're calling them to because they have something in their life that they have not been able to get over, that they continue to fall short. But Father, we thank you for our mediator, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. Thank you, Lord, that our sins are forgiven, that we never have to question our salvation or relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, that our righteousness has been divinely imparted unto us by Jesus, and he's not taking that away. Thank you that we don't have to earn it or keep it. Thank you for the mercy and the grace that you show us, and help us to be people, Lord, when to show mercy and grace to each other. Help us to be willing to restore each other, to not judge each other, but to pray for each other, to encourage and to edify And to do all of that with a spirit that's Christ-like, a spirit of gentleness and meekness. Being humble, knowing that any one of us could fall to the same thing as is stated in Galatians. Lord, do a great work in us through your Holy Spirit. Transform our hearts, Lord. Transform our minds. Create a culture in us, Lord. And where we're just willing to be open and honest with each other, Lord. We're not seeking to make others think of us in a way that we are not on the inside. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for our relationship with you, for allowing us to be here this morning. Have your way with us. Give us courage as we seek to live for you this week, as we seek to impact those around us. Empower us, embolden us. Give us the words to speak when we're in conversations with people. Give us wisdom and give us opportunity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. One of the things I've found as I've tried to choose hymns that go along with the themes of what of what we've been studying is that there is a incredible lack of hymns that deal that deal with interpersonal relationships with you know within a church 
that they're almost always about, you know, pray, you know, there's rightfully so praising God, praising Christ, and, and, and then also, you know, things about my relationship with God, but how we deal with each other. There's so few hymns, and I struggled with one on this one, and I didn't really come up with something there, but I, I hope that this one um, is talking about repentance and uh, coming back to God as you wandered from him will we'll play a part of that, us being open with, with, uh, you know, with, with our sin and, and our need to deal with it. So it's number 490. Sorry it took me so long to get to that. 490, Lord, I'm coming home. Please stand. I've wandered far away from God, now I'm coming home. The past of sin too long I've trod, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home. Coming home, never more to roam. Open while thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. I've wasted many precious years. Now I'm coming home. I now repent with bitter tears. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home, coming home. Never more to coming home. I've tired of sin and straying, Lord. Now I'm coming home. I'll trust thy love, believe thy word. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. My soul is sick, my heart. Now I'm coming home, my strength renew, my hope restore, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to coming home. All right. Our benediction this morning is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, which says, Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and gave us eternal comfort and good hope through grace, Comfort your hearts and establish them in every good work and word.
We're getting closer to getting the masks off. But until we do, let's continue to, to leave in an orderly fashion from the back to the front and uh, this side out this door and this side out door, that door. And uh, praying that you all have a great week in the Lord. God bless.